So just a short recap, um, our last day on Tuesday was where we went over some data set examples and interpretations. Diane went through the classic section of Cretaceous wave dominated shore face deposits and how you would measure through classic parasequences as is shown on the right hand side. Basil went through some of the different drawing options that are available. And then um, Liz did a management project showing uh, some examples of the Permian Brushy Basin and how you could use short outcrops um, and try to correlate these together. And also how you could use multiple users and actually share data uh, in a project. And those, some examples of those are also shown at the right. So today we have your projects and this is where you've given us some of your links and uploads. Um, we have Doug Walker with us who's the PI of the project who will be going over the database structure and then Basil and Nick will talk about the future Strabo 2 that's coming up and we'll briefly summarize and go over the survey. Um, Strabo 2 might be sleeker and better and uh, much of your input that we get from this particular workshop should be used to um, help us improve in the next iteration. So we're going to start off with your projects and we got quite a few of them. Uh, bottom line, they are very cool. Uh, we picked out a few that we would like to go through. You know, unfortunately we can't go through all, of, we don't have time to go through all of them, but we'll take about 25 minutes or so to go through some examples. And as we go through these examples, if you can give your name and your affiliation just briefly, kind of just what the project is about, its location, the age and formation, the overall depositional environment, and what you feel is some of the strongest significance or why you put this up. And um, it's essentially some of the information that you put on the spreadsheet. Probably we only want to take about two or three minutes per example, and Casey will actually help drive us through. And then um, towards the end, after we go through some of these examples, if you can be thinking, what were some of the short little tips or tricks that you found were very helpful in your generation of your particular example? Um, and maybe we can take a few minutes to share those. So I think right now I will stop sharing and I'll let Casey do the driving. View Casey screen. And we thought we'd start off by taking a trip to Spain. And so Peter Jaswicki, I hope you're, you're on and um, you can maybe walk us through your spot. Sure, I'm, I'm a good example. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm here. Um, so I, I picked a location uh, in, in Spain. It's a Cretaceous age, uh, rudest uh, reef, shell water, uh, marine, obviously. And um, my spot, I, I used a line to represent the stratigraphic section because the rocks here are basically uh, vertical. Um, and so a satellite image is like a cross section. And so um, I, I traced the, the stratigraphic section there, um, as you can see, and it goes through um, some two sort of shell platform intervals, which are the gray rocks, and then the tan bed right in the middle is that where the label is is, is a, a deeper water marl facies. In this case, the bottom of the section is up on, on the north and the, and the top is the south. And I did put two maps there. Uh, you can see on the right, uh, yeah, one, one is just a bait, uh, satellite image. The other one is this one with interpretation, which kind of shows you, um, you know, what we're going through. It's section B1 on the left is the measure section going through two platforms. And, then, um, you know, and, and as shown there, uh, and then the whole section is truncated by an angular unconformity with lots of missing time. Uh, and then I did include a stratigraphic column uh, with a few, um, you know, about, about 215 meters. Uh, and, and I, I um, put in the facies as well as, uh, you know, each, each one has all the fossils and sedimentary structures and such. And then in addition, in several intervals, there are, there are photographs. There's about 15 of them attached there. So you can see, um, you know, basically uh, what things look like in the outcrop. There is one showing three sort of stepping cycles that go from um, rudest thickets. They're, they're uh, cigar shaped, um, basically long, thin, very socialis, which this basically is 100% of those up to a grainstone cap. Uh, and then you repeat that cycle again and again throughout these platforms. Um, I can go on, but. Uh, 
I think that's more than two minutes. Okay, yeah, that was great. I, I thought one of the things, go ahead and show that one, Casey. Um, yeah. Peter's got some great photos in here and I thought this would be terrific for teaching and I really like that overlay that you did on the, uh, on the outcrop photo. I think that also really kind of helped set the scene. So I, we thought this was a really nice example of um, something that we could use for teaching. Did you want to say anything else, Peter, just quick? No, I think so too. It's part of a project we're doing um, where we've, uh, we've identified this, this sort of um, outcrop, which is actually fairly well known and one of the best sort of rudest outcrops uh, that I know of. Um, and it's actually on top of an anticline. And we've done some recent work out there with, with structural geologists. And we've realized that the anticline was actually growing uh, be, be because of uh, salt underneath it prior to the deformation of the Pyrenees. Uh, and, and so um, we kind of recognize a salt tectonic episode of um, deformation prior to the onset of convergence. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. And, and I, plan, I plan to actually, um, you know, put in other sections. So I have about five of them out there that we can correlate. Um, and it goes beyond the images I've shown. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Well, let's try moving on to another example. And we strongly encourage you to explore these on your own because there's a lot here and we don't have time to show them all, but there's some really great examples. So Tom Hickson, um, we thought that yours had, was a nice example showing multiple sections with interpretations. So if you could give us a short overview as Casey does the driving. Sure, as you can, if you don't mind having the music at Starbucks in the background. What's the music in the background? <laughs> It's, it's called Starbucks <laughs> in Rockford, Illinois. So uh, this is all part of a, a project where we're um, interested in looking at the lateral variability in microbiolite, lacustrine microbiolite facies. Uh, and um, if you look at the, the south, uh, if you look at the, the sections here, the southern section is uh, essentially interbedded conglomerates, uh, microbiolites, and you want to go ahead and click on it and bring up the section, Casey, that'd be awesome. Um, you'll see it's uh, interbedded um, uh, conglomerates uh, and uh, microbialite limestones uh, near the base. Uh, even though those like the conglomerates at the top look like they're massive, they actually do have uh, stromatolites growing on them. Uh, and so we are literally at the at essentially a playa margin with a, in an alkaline lake uh, with really uh, pervasive microbialite growth. Uh, and now, uh, if you go to the section fifteen, the, the third section. Sorry, we'll just that's all right. We'll do this. <laughs> yeah, just go to the link on section three. There you go. Oh boy. Oh, that's a good. <laughs> <laughs> Getting the global context for the day. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, as, as he's uh, searching for that, um, two of my students who are on today, uh, Maddie Frisk and Owen Landry, they're the ones that entered data for some of these. I did a couple of them and they did others. Uh, and so this is, notice now we've gone into almost uh, purely uh, carbonates, um, almost all the custard, um, all, all the custard, I'm sorry, and all microbialite rich with uh, normal stromatolites, uh, stratiform stromatolites, uh, big bioherms, things like that. Um, I had linked images to some of these. Um, I, uh, I'm not as familiar with, there we go. So you could uh, pop up in one of those. Yeah, so here's a nice little uh, uh, stratiform stromatolite going up into a small domal stromatolite. Uh, and um, so you can explore this and you can see some fairly the amazing diversity laterally within the same interval um, of uh, microbialite morphologies and textures. Um, I've also linked out to samples and I'm, I'm pretty close that I'll be able to link some photography to some of those samples as well. Um, uh, so yeah, go ahead and take a look at another photo. Okay, I uh, think after this we'll move on to the next one, but this has some really nice examples of the microbial lights and you were one of the few to show these. 
Yeah, and I just think the lateral variation, the having multiple people like what Liz showed us, uh, it worked very, very well. Yeah, great. Okay, nice. Fun area. That's a nice picture too, overview. All right, great, thank you, Tom. Let's move on to uh, Rachel. Rachel um, was one of the participants that actually used the image base map and had a different strategy and we thought you'd have fun seeing her example of KARST. Rachel, are you on? Uh, yeah, okay, right. uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. So uh, my field area is the Central Kentucky KARST, and this, um, so we need to get to the image base map from here. There it is. So this is Liz, and I just want to point out, just to, in, in case folks didn't catch that, so we went to the geographic spot, and then Casey just opened up an image base map, and that's actually where uh, Rachel's uh, section spots sit. Right, so what I've done is taken a screenshot out of QGIS, and so this is, this is the base map for uh, my field study looking at landscape evolution. So this is more of a geomorphology approach and there are a few small strat columns within these different locations. So let's go to uh, Crystal Onyx Cave because that has the most uh, diverse things happening. So there's another base map within. So it's, it, it's very um, taking advantage of the layer potential of the uh, Strabo spot. So this is the cave map that is published on the uh, Crystal Onyx website. This is a commercial cave in uh, Cave City, Kentucky, and I have two sites within this cave. Uh, one is up near Enchanted Forest in the upper level, and then the other is near the, uh, very close to the lower entrance. So this, um, I guess, overview, this is all these caves in this region are within uh, Mississippian carbonates. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the clastic deposits in the caves um, to get an idea of the overall evolution of the landscape. So there, so we want to go to the strat section for uh, Enchanted Forest. And so there was an image here, but it's not, not coming up. That's interesting. What was nice here is that you also showed where your samples were. Right. So, yeah, so there's a, it's kind of convenient that there are these. So I was unable to find any, any way to mark uh, travertine or speleothems within here. So I'm, there's a flowstone that overlays this uh, this relatively recent uh, clastic deposit. If your image is on the strat section, you can go to the th uh, the little menu below the plus minus, and maybe it'll show or not. Yeah, I don't see it on the layers. Okay. Hmm. That's strange. Well, we're at the yeah we're at the flows. Um, layer, which is, oh, that's just because that's selected. So, okay. Um, the, yeah, so the, the sand at the bottom, I have a one sample there for uh, cosmogenic dating to do uh, aluminum, aluminum, beryllium uh, burial dating. And then there's a nice uh, flowstone layer, which I, categorized as a recrystallized re limestone. And so that um, probably uh, led dating on that so we can get a good constraint on uh, when this uh, karst was hydrologically active. Okay, great. So that's, that's, I guess, yeah, about <laughs> this, is, this is Liz again, and I just wanted to point out too that I think this sort of um, embedding, the ability to embed sections into images like this, you know, I don't, Casey, if you need to navigate away now, that's cool, but um, I just wanted to highlight that that's, I, I can imagine cases where you might have like a, a paleontology site, or in this case, you know, so for, first of all, with the caves, that was the best way Rachel could orient us 
right, when you have this sort of 3D depth structure. So the, the, the fact that you can do that uh, more specifically than just putting a bunch of points <laughs> in XY coordinates is really nice. And then we also thought that this is nice if, if you had some sensitive localities that you didn't want to um, have very specific uh, coordinate information to the localities themselves to actually put them generally um, onto a, a base map like this is another way uh, of handling that. So it was, it was yeah. a nice way Rachel was interacting with the data set, we thought. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, all of these are, are geolocated with Latin long, and these are all um, currently public locations, but yeah, this does allow the possibility to um, protect uh, resources that we might not want to publicize. Um, the, an, a good example, actually, of using the cave to do the um, stratigraphy, if you go to the Mammoth Cave entrance, um, some of you may have actually been here. So this is a, we can go to that, I did an image base map here as well, nested within, um, and then made note of these specific uh, stratigraphic points of interest that you could see actually on the historic cave tour, which might even be open right now. Yeah, fun resource. Okay, thank you very much. Let's um, take a trip to Colorado with Teresa Schwartz, and Teresa is going to Tell us about fluvial architecture. Teresa, are you there? I am. Sorry, Great. I was trying to find my unmute button. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, I just posted one short section um, of a through a fluvial deposit through the lower, uh, not Renova formation, Raton formation. I'm working on too many things at once, apparently. Um, and this section is what I think a uh, uh, pretty classical uh, sinuous fluvial deposit. And so the section I'm showing really just shows a really classic upward finding succession through a series of accretion sets followed by abandonment style facies at the top of the channel fill and then up into overlying floodplain deposits. And um, one thing I'd like to mention is, you know, here what I tried to do was capture some of the, you know, sub-meter detail in the different bed sets, especially toward the top of the succession. And um, I, I looked and looked and tried to turn off some of those labels for the different units here because as you zoom in and zoom out, they tend to clutter, you know, a lot of the section that you're <laughs> you're looking at and when you're trying to look at larger scale or broader scale patterns in the stacking um, that gets a little bit obscured. And so I actually was hoping to ask you guys a question to see if you can turn those different unit labels off um, or not. No, yeah. I don't, don't think so. Okay. Okay, cool. We well, I guess that, that might be a good suggestion for the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, otherwise, I, I didn't add any photos, but I did play around with adding some different spots just to uh, make notes on the different features that were here. And altogether, I'd say I, I felt like this was pretty successful <laughs> trying to draw this in Strabo. Yeah, and it was nice that you had some labels on here. You showed your finding upward. And you were one that actually kind of modified some of your units from the boxes and showed the finding upwards. Great. Yeah, All thank right. you guys. Thank you. How about if we go to uh, another example of depositional environments with Luciano and Gabriel in Argentina, some examples of shallow marine and forced regression. Yes. Hi. Go ahead, we can hear you. Okay. Well, we studied um, a sequence, a, a post-glacial sequence of the Carboniferous, and we have to make a detailed characterization to a sedimentological uh, characterization to determine um, if there are only shallow marine features or it was also um, an environment transitional to a delta. 
and we found a lot of um, para sequences and a lot of uh, stratigraphical um, features that are very interesting. Um, we made three sections, and we can show that one that you were. Uh, yes, that one. Uh, it's very interesting because we found um, a force regression surface um, between um, a transitional zone to um, shore phase, uh, lower shore phase environment. And we have uh, very nice images of uh, hammocky stratifications and also some ripples. And we found a very net contact between these two fascias. Um, and we found it in, in two different locations. So it was really, really nice. OK. Great. And yeah, Casey's just joined a couple. You had some really nice photos here. Yes. <laughs> Great. OK. Thank you very much. Let's move on to another example with Terry Jordan looking at some of the Pleistocene deposits, glacial fluvial. Terry, are you there? Or Corey? Can, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, I had to unmute. Okay, so we're in the Ithaca, New York area. Um, there is a very little exposure of the late Pleistocene, Holocene sediments, but just east of the Cornell campus, uh, Fall Creek has had enough erosion to do some spectacular exposures. And so, um, if you load those, yeah, so this is a rough spot of, of a distance accessible by public trails uh, over which the outcrop photo that's about to come up um, is a panorama of it. And we've never analyzed it before, but in preparing for remote online field trips next semester, we've thought we should bring them right here into Ithaca. And the section on the north, we have two sections, and they're basically stratigraphically, um, they, you need to put a composite of them together to get the whole story. But uh, we have um, a stratigraphic section up a nose in that photo and then another one at the south end of the outcrop. They have fluvial facies, deltaic facies, and glacial facies dominated by conglomerates. So an environment close to a melting nose of a glacier with incredibly coarse sediments. Um, so it I wouldn't say it coarsens upward, but it becomes more consistently coarse upward. And we did have a question, uh, that thick unit at the top, it's the TR represents till reduced. Um, it didn't, we didn't seem to find choices of lithologic descriptions that really met, fit tills particularly well, but um, we're, we're new to this and maybe it's in there somewhere so yeah, well and maybe you'll have some suggestions that we can add in <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you um yeah what we liked is that yours also showed some more of the conglomeratic uh, types of lithologies and be interested to see if you use some of this travel spot in these locations for teaching online thank um, you those those decisions need to be made but we now know enough to make a decision <laughs> <laughs> right I think we're all in the same boat. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Um, let's move on to Tracy Frank. Um, Tracy will show us some glacial marine carbonates. I meant to unmute myself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So this is uh, a section of lower Permian rocks located on a little island off the coast of Tasmania. And uh, we were looking at this section as part of a broader study of the late Paleozoic Ice Age. And I thought I would use this section because it's an interesting mix of glacial marine deposits and carbonates. 
And basically what we have, if you look at the uh, shelf there, along the shoreline there, that is um, a, a lot of, of drop stones, a diamond of sorts that form during deglaciation. And then in the wake of that, uh, carbonate started forming and most of the cliff that you see there is actually carbonate deposits. And the carbonate deposits range from very fine grain things that formed in quiet water with a lot of bryozoans and stuff like that to very coarse deposits made up of these large uridesmid bivalves. And those are the layers that you see sticking out more in the cliff. And within that, there are big drop stones here and there. You can kind of see one at the base of the cliff in the image there that's showing. Um, uh, so anyway, I thought this would be an interesting test of this uh, um, system to make stratigraphic sections. And uh, it, it worked fairly well. I like the, the ability to tie in images of different things. So if you actually click on the uh, unit names off to the right there, you can see some good overview images of what these rocks look like. And I also tied some images to um, some, of the, some of the beds here. I did run into a few problems though, because some of the coarser grained uh, carbonates, the rudstone facies, are actually more lensoid. And I guess when I draw a stratigraphic section, I like to be able to illustrate that a little bit more. And that's not really possible using this. But mm -hmm. uh, over, overall, I like it. I like the way you can, you can tie a lot of data together and you can go back and get a nice overview of what the section look like yeah gorgeous field area <laughs> that's not too bad yeah <laughs> yeah great thank you tracy mm -hmm. that's a nice example of varied lithologies too um let's go to steve and jessica because their project was different in that it incorporated multiple cores we've got sections from all over the world Steve or Jessica, are you there? Yeah, I think we're both. I think we're both here. Great. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just introduce and and let Jess because I think that's the cross section we did. We we have over uh, four hundred ninety meter long cores from the Bengal Basin and the the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, and um, we're interested in trying to get this into a, a framework that was more broadly shared with uh, the community and could work into teaching. Um, in hindsight, I think I spent too much time trying to do multiple cores instead of putting more details and photos and descriptions of each core, but that certainly could be added later. Um, and so Jess had done a longitudinal transect uh, along the river and I had done one across the basin. So um, Jess, you want to, uh, describe and show what you had done? Sure. Um, so I did the cores that start basically at the delta apex and go down to the coast. And for each of those cores, we have um, a series of samples that have been described for um, grain size. So when we were uh, plotting the strat sections for those, we've shown basically like the generalized um, grain size breakdown for those. Um, one of the things that we kind of or I struggled with a little bit is because we're looking at cores that are up to about 100 meters in depth, but the depth varies. We um, kind of normalized everything to a 100 meter depth and started at um, with the surface at 100 and then going down. So um, if you open up the strat section for just one of those, you can see that we have a lot of um, extra at the bottom and then um, <clears throat> kind of the rest of it is filled in there. Yeah, so for um, some of these, I have um, the kind of overall picture showing um, just in the field what all the samples look like. And then um, I've gone in and added the samples, not on the strat section, but um, within the actual spot itself. Um, so, yes, yeah, Steve, I don't know if you want to add anything else about this. You've got the core image in there too, right? If we put um, that image. Like 
the um, the sample the samples like spread out on the sheet in the actual like spot for the core. Um, so I think if yeah, so there yeah, should so be we're looking at the at that particular spot. That's what we're looking at now here. So yeah. So you can see like all the different samples that we've got um, and that's yeah so that's the image showing just in the field what all the stamp all the samples look like yeah neat and it was fun because your example was one that was the, the sediments and you've got a lot of um, different samples and a variety yep yeah and i think uh just to just to steve's point of uh it you know, uh, there's only so much time you have, and if you want to put in lots of sections versus details in one, um, you know, I think just to highlight, I think that's the one of the goals of having the field app is because if you were describing core or taking these sections in the field directly into the app, then uh, presumably it would be easier for us to capture all this data the first time. But but uh, yeah, I, I, the going back retroactively always takes quite a bit of time to enter things in. Yeah, so I just wanted to jump in for a, a little bit today to talk about the data management and what goes on with the, the data science and geoinformatics part of Strava Spot. Um, and for Strava said how the data are dealt with, but it's it's all the same for um, all of Strava Spot. And I think Basil introduced this pretty well the first day that the idea of a spot is an area of um, some commonality uh, it can be any size from a spot on a, a laser spot to a mountain range and uh, the idea is is that for the geosciences and especially for the field geosciences we have to think about our data in terms of a model that's called the long tail and you may have heard about this it's a common marketing uh, phenomenon but it's a common data mark uh, data uh, model as well. And basically there are some things that are really, really common uh, that are used all the time, like a Ford Focus, uh, tens of, you know, tens of millions of these around uh, as compared to something on the other end, like an Aston Martin 177, which I think there's like 15 of these. And again, it's just how it's distributed. How would this look for geology? And that's what I want to show now not for a set example, but one that I think everybody has used at some point in your past or currently in teaching, looking at the ring of fire and looking at tectonics around the Pacific. And we all can realize we have this nice figure from the USGS of, of earthquakes and locations. But what we have to realize is that this is the picture we would show everybody. This is the picture that seismologists would use. So this is for the Sumatran earthquake in 2012, uh, wiggle traces for um, the seismic event. This is from IRIS. And basically what this is showing is data that sits pretty far out on the long tail. There are a few people, uh, I don't know how many, probably not, any more than a few tens that would look at this data and really want to understand it and see the data at this level. Uh, most of the time when we're looking with this, we might jump into a paper uh, like this, uh, for, again from the USGS for the Tonga subduction zone showing the locus of earthquakes, uh, something about their depth location as well as focal mechanisms if they can be plotted in the upper left. Etc. So this is kind of in the middle of the of the data tail. Uh, it's not the real detailed information, but it's not the really really general information that we might see in this tacit graphics for a subduction zone. That would be sort of the final product, and the the final product's what uh, undergraduate students see. It's a very large uh, cross section of people, a very large market that sees this final product. Whereas down in the lower right here very, very few people ever get to that, uh, or in fact, even need to get to that. That's really for the domain experts and the, the experts behind the science. So uh, when we get into geology, we, well, into more geology and into Strabo spot, uh, we have exactly the same sort of situation. And you guys have been in dealing with this and looking at this all week. 
um, where this is a, a detailed geologic map uh, that's actually in Strabo. Uh, this is a GIS version, an illustrator version. But when we get to that, it's a really complicated data set. There's points, lines, polygons, there's a topographic base, we have observations. Somebody probably mapped on paper maps and in, in, in the field. Uh, actually, this was all collected digitally from the start, but, but most of the time uh, you would have that. And once you have these data, how do you share it? How do you integrate it? How do you stick it in in common with other data? And I think you guys have seen this week uh, the power in, <coughs> in Strabo Spot, which is an example of, of electronic way of sharing data. So uh, what we do behind the, un under the hood, behind the scenes in Strabo Spot is we put these, these data together uh, in a way that you guys just showed you can share pretty easily. Um, and so, um, a second. So uh, what we again have is for that geologic mapping, uh, that's, that's something very detailed, not many people would look at, but that all informs and makes the larger picture that we see here for the GSA map of, of North America. So a lot of the stuff we're putting together is out on the long tail, but it's absolutely critical um, to understanding overall geology. It's the documentation, it's the ground truth that goes behind all of this. So just think about it that way. When you're out on the, the longer part of the tail, it takes, um, in the lower part, it, it takes more work to do that. And that's where we're trying to put the workflow together and, and try to understand how people work. For geologic maps, uh, this all started out pretty simply uh, decades ago with GIS. And this is a showing a, a user interface for a GIS package. Um, and you can see here that the data are arranged here by, oh, for example, this blue line here, the contact type, uh, depositional, non-conformable, et cetera. And we can uh, look at other values that might be faulted, change these things around to different types if we want. So GIS was a pretty powerful uh, way of putting things together. Uh, to start with, it had geographic accuracy. And uh, starting around 99, you could actually carry GIS in the field on a computer and work with it. So all of these go back to uh, putting your data into a database. And hopefully you haven't heard the word database used very much this week. Uh, that's behind the scenes. Uh, that's really, it, it's like when you go to Amazon and shop, um, you try to find something, you don't see the massive data structure that they have behind uh, the scenes. So what is a database? It's just what you think it is, organized body of related information, a lot of information, large collection of data organized for search and retrieval. And it's this idea of especially for rapid search and retrieval will jump on. I think the database that a lot of people are very, very familiar with is the idea of a flat file. And you've all done this in Excel you've put your data together and things like this. This is just starting out uh, some sample names with an identifier, some isotope values, some age values. And uh, so this comes in and uh, it's rows and columns. This is what you would find published in Excel. But where's all the information about the analysis method standards and sample characteristics? And, and a lot of times that's called the metadata. Um, data about data, but, but really it's the supporting information that goes into this. And so, for example, for the strontium values, you would have a lab, a standard value, a normalization, a method. And these are all really important to have. Um, what we're doing here is we're looking at this in a, a relational database approach where uh, we have a table shown in the upper left of measured values and they are done by some method. And then we have another table that document, documents the methodology. 
And so this uses uh, multiple tables that hold unique values as much as we can. And then the table, you can see the method number here. That's the relationship. That's the key that goes from table to table. And so what we end up doing is, is in relational structures, we build up all these tables like this, where we start uh, with a one table for uh, values and methods, and then the lab can have a description, et cetera. So you, you try to contain unique data as much as you can. And, and that's a word uh, that, that's referred to as normalized databases. Um, and when you want to understand something, you, you look at what we call a join between the tables uh, that's based on these keys. So an item measured in table one, eventually you can work your way through a set of joins to an address for a lab. Now, re relational databases, I think a lot of people think of them as relational because they relate tables to table. Uh, the, Real meaning is that, um, and, and in the mathematical sense, is that this is be, uh, based on relational algebra, which is a uh, language math algebra of its own. Uh, the thing to know is that when you have these, you have a lot of rules, the structure is very uh, rigid, and uh, depending upon what you're doing and how you change things, you can break a lot of the, the parts of it, the relationships. Uh, if you change a method number from five to six, uh, it changes everything about your data, and that's kind of hard to see. Um, and when you do this, this is a project uh, I started a long time ago on NavDAT and EarthCam for geochemistry. And when you do this, you end up with these enormous tables with lots and lots of relationships between it. And basically, nobody really wants to see this. It's, it's really hard to, to manage. And you look at a lot of, of data sets, um, their back end is going to look something like that. So that's very tried and true way of going. Uh, relational algebra is well known. It was very efficient on space storage. And back when a two megabyte hard drive was a big hard drive, efficiency was was really a, a key. Nowadays we don't worry about that and as Basil uh, said in his intro earlier this week we're working on what we call a graph database or a graph approach where basically um, you have different entities like a layer or an act fold axis or a fold that you can all relate together. So the idea here is that you have entities or nodes in the database and they have relationships between them. So that uh, the graph approach basically says, okay, we have a node that has a bunch of attributes and then between those we have edges or relationships. Graph theory is also really, really well developed mathematically and, and so this is just harnessing a, a different field of, of data science in looking at how the data are put together and related to each other. Um, very nice approach to get to. One of the things in, in this graph approach that's especially good is that um, you can find things in relationships quickly. So I, I said that in the uh, relational world, we talked about joins. And joins are how many tables you put together, and that's what is called depth on this axis. and Joins with lots of data can be really, really slow. Um, so five joins basically could make it impossible to uh, complete. In a graph, these joins are trivial, and that's how the system's set up. So that even getting near a million entries uh, as a result is very, very quick on a graph. Basically, in the relational uh, field, that would be like you're trying to um, find an entry for the United States and you have to uh, search 300 million records every time to find it. Uh, whereas if you think more about the Kevin Bacon approach, uh, you know something to start with. Uh, you can zip from one person to another very, very quickly through these relations. So that's the approach that, that is quite fast. 
So when we do this, the rules are a lot simpler. Uh, a lot of what we do is look at a lexicon or a vocabulary. You guys have been working a lot with that week, this that this week. Uh, there's still some rules. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you still have a rule on what the dominant fold geometry can be and whether you can have one geometry or multiples. There's there's still got to be some rules, but they're not nearly as strict or as as uh, hard to get around as they are for relational structures. So that's, that's important to remember. The other thing that, that happens in Strabo spot, and basically it happens in all of, of data science these days, is uh, you use some kind of, of encoding or representation for your data. And we use something called JSON, JavaScript object notation, and in our case, uh, GeoJSON, which is geographically um, uh, specific. These sorts of languages, these sorts of formats uh, are very, very common and really, really well known. Uh, you look at this simple thing for a, a location here, um, looks pretty simple. You get into a bigger data set. This is uh, actually a Strabo data set. It's a lot more complicated, or it seems more complicated, but this is actually pretty readable. Um, it may not look readable right now, but, but in, at the end of the day, it's not too bad. And the nice thing about its readability is that computer scientists and data scientists just know how to read that stuff. So this is an example, first example I found years and years ago that Mike Taylor put together. He's also at KU and he was doing some GIS work for uh, active tectonics in the Andes and South America. And you can look from his data list down here. He has KML file, shapefile, GMT, um, was uh, the GMT package and this GeoJSON package. Uh, he just output these in these formats. I don't think Mike really knew what GeoJSON was at the time that he did this, but a huge number of people did. So Mike put this up at GitHub. Uh, GitHub uh, doesn't know anything about geology, uh, uh, but it knows everything about GeoJSON. So even though um, you're looking at a site that is uh, a code repository and a versioning uh, software. They know how to read GeoJSON, so they take the active faults in South America and tell you what they are, uh, translate this. And whoever put together this interface, I can guarantee knows nothing about geology. So this is the whole point is that we're, with Strabo Spot, we're using what we think is a much quicker way to explore and move through data and we're packaging it up in a way that even if we um, go away, we don't know what to do, the data's all packaged that million, well, hundreds of thousands of people could just go in and in a, a few seconds or just using a standard tool could read. Um, this is all done, again, in the data structure and in the background by something we call web services. And what web services are, they're just a way of, of sending a request. You know, when you put a URL and you do a search and it's like 10 lines long, that's actually a web service sending out a, a message to something we call an, an application uh, programming interface, APIs, um, uh, not the Strat section API, but a computer section API. And this is a very quick and open way of doing it. Security doesn't become any kind of issue for this. The other thing that uh, Strabo is doing is there's a big push for what's called FAIR data. There's a lot of different descriptions of this, but basically once your data is in Strabo, it's findable, accessible, interoperable because we, we follow some rules and then other people can reuse it and look at it. So we're striving to make the data fair. Um, you can search the data. It's downloadable in GeoJSON, GIS. You saw other formats and we get the full metadata behind it. So uh, this is a, a structure that we follow, a philosophy that we follow. And in, in getting there, we try to keep things interoperable as much as possible. So you all have seen this uh, this week as well. You can take your data, uh, 
and uh, select output formats like shapefiles, KMZ, Excel, field books, rat sections for you. This example I'm showing is reusable and interoperable because the, the first spot entered into uh, Strabo in late 2014 is in this particular data set, and that data set is still completely usable. Um, so you can go in there, you can find information about a shift sample, uh, you can output to KMZ, KML, uh, and display on maps. You've seen that this week as well. And for structural geology, you can output to a standard uh, plotting program like Rick Almendinger's StereoMet Mobile. So what the data is doing here, hopefully for, for everybody, is it's being fair. What Strabo is doing is uh, kind of serving this, uh, the really more specific long tail and sort of sweeping up the detritus uh, if you will, of, of this long tail into a place where we can look at it and explore it as we need to. So uh, first I want to say everybody has done an amazing job of getting from um, basically ground zero to getting strat sections up. It was very impressive to see. Um, the go, there is power in just sharing the data and sharing tools like the Strabo tools and other tools that people will develop once that data is available. So we've already sort of entered into a new world in terms of doing new kinds of science that we couldn't have done before by just sharing data with each other. So I, I think that's worth just reflecting on that. The second thing it's worth reflecting on is that this is a community tool. So it will be continuing to develop as things that this community wants to wants to do. So it's not something that's out of your power. It's really something that is a tool for you to use and to move forward with. But what I'm going to show you today are a couple things that are new and that will help you, I think, in some clear ways. Searching and micrographs. So searching relatively quickly because we've talked a lot about this. There is an old way, there's a new way that's now developed, and then there's a new and improved way that's coming. So we have a new grant proposal, we will be working on the search functionality. The bad news is it's not ready. The good news is that you can help us figure out what it should look like. So you've already seen this as this, this Java spot search. I think a lot of people were having problems because it averages where your position was. So if you have one position in Nevada, two in Alabama, you wound up in Arkansas. So the point is that you just have to make sure you lose those um, stray spots. Um, so that it averages. So this is one site that I did in Baraboo, Wisconsin that you've seen. I did this for teaching. It doesn't really matter. So you can look at it this way. You can link as you know. Um, and then this is the way you just hit the button, the link button on the, the lowest most button, and it just tells you that, but you already know that. This is the new search interface. Um, it will look like this instead. Uh, you have seen this um, a little bit, which is you have a whole lot more information of different criteria, the day it was collected, whether it has a strat column, um, that sort of thing. As you move forward, I'm just going to demonstrate a few of those options. So, for instance, if you want to just know the data was collected, you can go in um, this way and look at it. So that's one possibility. You'll know that you can set the, so there's lots of different search criteria. This is one that sets a minimum and a maximum. But you'll also notice the green plus, which means you don't have to have a single criteria. This works very much like a search for geo rep. If you wanna do date collected plus strat section, you can do that. Um, so here's a keyword search. There's also open text searches. So anything that has the word myelinite in it, you could do. Um, or here where before we uh, had this, I think we more than doubled it at this point, is looked at the different strat columns. The next example is a double search. So here we have strat section plus the keyword for carbonate. So uh, two weeks ago, these were the, the three strat sections that had carbonates in them. Here's where they came from, and then you could see where they existed in the world. The point being, 
um, that it works very much like a GeoRef search. It's very smooth. It, we thought that GeoRef functionality was something everybody understood, so that is already in place. If people have other ideas about how to search um, that you would like, um, besides just a geographic search or a GeoRef type search, again, just let us know. Um, and right, you can search on keywords. Keywords is going to be an important one. Right now, the keywords are going to be just in the notes page. Um, we can make them more open, so keywords anywhere in any description, but it's going to take a lot more effort to do than that. So if we can decide where to look for those keywords, um, then we can sort of facilitate that. That's all the keywords though are free text keywords. The standard vocabulary, so the terms that are in StravoSpot can always be searched on. So hummocky cross stratification, it's a vocabulary word that you can always search on that. Um, so the, for the keywords, it's, I've highlighted in the red rectangle, the notes page. This is again for Baraboo. So I've done this as a teaching as, assignment sort of to, to give it out. And um, so it sits on the CERC website as well. But for instance, this would be the place where you could put things where people know that you can definitely look for a keyword search um, in the notes page and it would know, oh yeah, if, I, if there's something that's really important about this cross section, it needs to go in notes. Um, okay, I think that's what I wanted to talk about with search. The other thing that's going to be hugely advantageous to anybody who uses thin sections for their work is that we're doing a micrograph mode. And the mic we call it micrograph because the structural geologists use it for microstructures, petrologists use it for chemistry, um, different communities do it for something else, but we're all using micro images of microscopic um, data, mostly from thin sections, although it can also be from billets. The thin sections, rather than thin sections, the thin sections will be seamlessly linked with the field geology. You will go from one to the other. But, and the, 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 the template of spots and tags still works. But like mapping mode and strat mode, which are two different ways of looking at your data, there's a different mode, which is micrograph mode. It still uses points, lines, and polygons, but there you need some additional functionality because you need to look at different imaging options at the same time. So like plane polarized, cross polarized, cathode luminescence, et cetera. So we have now a working prototype for this. This is Strabo Micro. There is a reference section. Okay, this rock started life as a sandstone, but then it got uh, much more structurally interesting and probably sedimentologically less so and it has become a deformed quartzite. Um, so here we go, I'm gonna highlight a couple of the fields here. So there is a reference section to which everything is tied. You'll see why that's so important in the next slide. There's functionality, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can highlight, you can put in a scale, that's a scale ruler, you can lasso it. Um, points, lines, polygons, and so you have these different, and then different uh, star, like emphasize a feature, so you have different um, tools that you can use. And here's the key, once you've developed community-based tools, the tools could work on thin sections, but they could also work in the field. So there's this back and forth where you get a lot of um, bang for your buck. All right, here is perhaps why you can see it would be really useful. So here is the reference micrograph in the background and now you can put a different overlay on that that shows exactly where it sits on the thin section because it's scaled very much like a map image is scaled or photo, uh, photo base map is scaled. And you can see where exactly that is with respect to the larger thin section. So, um, we do have funding to develop a community of people who are interested in working on the sedimentary petrology. Again, you're in a good position because you're following the structural geologists who are gonna, in this case, I think work about 95% of your problems out. 
because um, just where you are on the thin section has to be developed and is already be developed by us. And then you can sort of concentrate on just the things you want to do. If you want to be involved in that effort, you should let him know um, or let me know. And then we can um, all start moving together on that. I think that's going to be happening this summer. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to Nick to talk a little bit about Strabo 2. Uh, Basil, while you're transferring, let's see, a couple questions that came in while you're talking. Um, Tom is wondering about searching on tags. Yes, we will have the functionality to search on tags. We do not have that yet. So that is, um, that's one of the things we will want to do. One, one of the things for different communities is to think about if there's a reason to have community tags, like some things you agree on that you can search on, but that's beyond us. That's a community decision. Common tags has the advantage of common vocabulary, which is that you could search on it. But the advantage of tags is their flexibility that you can do whatever you want with them so there's and, and you um, could you could add forward. new vocabulary outside Absolutely. of the database if it emerges well right and the whole point that and doug alluded to this in the graph database system is we can always add new things that's the huge advantage of graph databases if we were using relational we couldn't do that but the disadvantage of 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 that approach is you have to keep the old terms as well because there's legacy data in there but, but there's no problem adding new terms. Great, thanks. And then uh, let's see, one other question that just came up quickly is the, the Strabo Micro is not available yet. That's a, that's a beta version at this that point. That is correct. That's a beta version right now. And so um, the, I think the first general micrograph stuff is probably sometime in the next academic year that will be available. Thanks. Great, so we're moving on to Nick. Yep, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah, so I am a postdoc at University of Wisconsin, uh, working with Basil, and um, so I'm a structural geologist. And we've been, I'm part of the team that's developing the next phase of what Strabo Spot, the, the application, is gonna look like. So um, we've been working for about 18 months on um, updating the structural geology portion of Strabo. And this summer, we're just getting started on developing the user interface for the next set of sedimentology tools. So I'll give you a quick demo of what the new Strava looks like for structural geology, and then a very brief sneak peek for what sedimentology could potentially look like. So the design goals for updating the user interface, there's kind of three I want to highlight. One is that the map and or stratigraphic section is always visible and kind of central to the user experience. And then the second is that we want to design an interface that is simple and flexi flexibly accommodates the different types of field workflows that different people have. And then the third is we're working to develop tools that make kind of the natural gestural types of uh, data input that we are now very used to doing on touch screens um, in make that data input um, that such that it enriches and speeds up the data collection process. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is I'm really talking about user interface. This new user interface uses the same data structure, so the same back end. And so any data that you're putting in now to the current version of Strabo, it's going to be fully viewable and editable. Um, just like it is, uh, but in, in this new user interface. So we're not, there's no, going to be no disruption in terms of the data. So I'm going to just switch to sharing a, a screen grab of an iPad. Uh, here we go. Um, so I'll just walk you very briefly through what the new Strava looks like. So if I sign in here, um, I can load a project from the server. I'll choose this one, hit OK. 
And this is the, the what the new Strapo looks like. So it's, it's very much map focused. Uh, I'll zoom to the extent of spots for this project. Uh, and the big change is that if I click on a on this spot, all of the data and photos pop up in what we're calling kind of a notebook view. So there's a summary page of all the data that you've input. Um, and to input new tools, um, down there are a bunch of toolboxes down at the bottom. So for example, strike and dip. Uh, this is something where the strike and dip, I'm moving the iPad around now. So you can see that it the strike and dip symbol dynamically changes. And to add measurements, I can simply tap on the compass. So very quickly, I can create a lot of measurements. Um, and I can bulk categorize all of them at once instead of categorizing them one by one. Um, and then another, so that's, you know, you get to a spot, you want to talk about, you want to talk some, with some detail, take a bunch of measurements at a spot. But we also have implemented something called shortcuts. I'll just turn on the shortcuts. And what shortcuts does is it you never have to interact with the spot data structure. If I want to take a measurement, I simply tap here. And as long as I, this window is open, if I tap to create a measurement, it will add a measurement to my current location, create a spot in the background. And if I want to add more detail, I can go to that spot, open it up in the notebook, add a note, add a sample, um, and then when I'm done, I can close the whole thing. Uh, so that's a kind of overview just to show you where we're going generally with, um, with Strabo. So that's the, that's the structural geology view. So uh, looking forward to how we're gonna bring this type of new user interface to sedimentology. Uh, this is kind of what we're envisioning um, the user interface might look like. And I'll just highlight a few key points. So there's the notebook view on the right. Um, there's all of the Strava vocabulary down at the bottom, similar to those toolboxes that I just showed you. And if you select a layer, it will show you the spot information and the ability to put in new data without making the strat column disappear. So you can always still reference that. We're gonna have some it's going to be much easier to add a new level. So this is kind of press and drag upward to create a new, uh, a new layer. And we're going to implement um, the ability to have what we've, maybe you've heard of this, of us referring to geomojis or emojis, basically little predefined um, bits of data that you can drag onto the, onto the different on stratigraphic heights, specific stratigraphic heights on your in section, or on your stratigraphic section. And finally, there's gonna be better integration with toggling between a map view and a strat column view. So you can see uh, where your different observation points are on a map as you build your strat column. So um, a few other pieces that I didn't show you in that mock-up. Uh, we want to improve strat section visualization as you're building it. We're gonna build some tools to uh, allow you to display notes, photos, or other customizable data summaries um, viewable next to the column. Um, I think that's a common request that we've heard a lot from you. And um, we're going to build other tools to richly edit the bed profile and surfaces and capture data from those edits into the data structure. Um, and this has been said before, but uh, it's a, we rely on uh, your questions and comments during the workshop to understand what the community needs are. So those have been extremely valuable. And you know, from, we've been reading those comments and thinking about how we can incorporate that into, into our design. And throughout the design process, we're gonna be continuing to reach out to different sections of the community for input. Great, thank you, Nick. It's really exciting and tantalizing when you get to see those examples of what might be coming up in the future. Okay, I will um, briefly share what we've got in terms of an overview and hopefully 
we'll still have some time for questions. Um, I hope you can see my screen here. Yes, we can. Okay, good. So to summarize what we've done in this essentially a five-day workshop where you work two days on your projects, we've been able to show you that there is an existing digital database through Stravospot, and that really is a huge accomplishment, even though there are some things that we know could greatly be improved. But this was a big step and really exciting for our whole community. Um, Stravospot has created a structure and a framework so that we can actually build on it uh, in the future, and many people will probably want to develop specific programs to do certain kinds of functions that add on to the database. We've been able to show that we can store and share some of our sedimentary field data, which initially I thought was just even too complex to capture, but it's really exciting to see how many of you were able to do that even in a short time. Hopefully things will be more graphical. Uh, we're able to um, incorporate analytical input. And one of the important things for all of us is that we're able to meet some of the requirements for NSF standards and open data sharing. Um, some other aspects of this that I hope you can see from the right-hand column that now you're quite used to, we get the basic functions that we were doing in our field notes. We can find our localities, we can, uh, describe different things. We can link uh, a lot of our maps, our samples, our images, any kind of data that we have, and everything is nested in this hierarchy. So it's really elegant to be able to have all of our data come together and to be able to scale uh, across so many different uh, portions of it, of our data. Uh, we have this multi-purpose. This is a, a structure that's not only for research, but we can strongly use this for teaching and even the vocabulary that we've developed. Our intent was that people could use this to teach students how do we think about um, structures, about lithologies, how is everything organized, what are some of the logical steps, and then the Strabblespot program actually lays out that vocabulary so people can see how the words are connected to the concepts. There's lots of improvements, of course, that can happen to the user interface, and some of the search functions that Nick and Basil talked about. Um, we want to continue to get some of that input from you uh, to see how we can improve this, but basically we're on a, a great road in the future. So a lot of future apps, APIs will interact with the database. Maybe even some of you that are in these specialized disciplines will be able to develop things in your research group that will be able to help others. So the future is exciting and uh, we have this opportunity now for just a couple of minutes, like maybe about two minutes or so to take any questions that people might have or, or major points that you wanna bring up before we close out.